Ahoy there, Captain Benzi here, coming at you with another developer Q&A video for Eve Echoes, and what a week it has been for asking the developers questions. Not only do we get our usual weekly dev Q&A, but yesterday, or Friday depending when you're watching this, the developers also did an AMA on the Eve Echoes official Discord, where players could ask them any questions they liked, the developers did everything they could to answer as many questions as possible in the time limit. I've taken screenshots of them all, I've gone through them. As 60 odd questions to cover. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to split that into two videos where I just go over everything chronologically or whether I'll do sort of like a highlights video or I don't know. But today, of course, we still have the developer Q&A and there is some really interesting stuff in this one that is actually kind of exciting to think about. And if you've played EVE Online at all, you might recognize the screenshot here that I've used for the background here and for the thumbnail. And that might be tantalizing if you know what it is, but we'll talk about that later. Now, for those of of you who don't know, each week the developers take four questions posed by the community, answer them, then post that response to both the official Eve Echoes Twitter account and Facebook page. Not everyone has access to social media, not everyone wants access to social media, so each week I go through these questions, I read them, I read the responses, and I give my own thoughts and opinions as well, and please be aware, these are my own thoughts and opinions. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below as well, you might agree with me, you might disagree agree, you might have some other cool ideas to hear about as well. And if you do enjoy this video, please let me know by slapping like on it and comment down below anyway. With all that said and done then, let's jump right into this week's developer Q&A, which is for the week of the 24th to the 30th of November. We're now in December, 2021 is coming to an end, and my goodness, I feel old. Question 1 then. With Sinusural fields and capitals being introduced, will we get Citadel add-on structures for jump bridges that work alliance-wide? Currently, most players organise themselves not as a corporation, but as an alliance, and these alliances often form bigger coalitions. I think this will be more uh, this will add more strategic depth to the game. And I kind of agree. This is definitely true, you know, how uh, corporations do. You know, in Nullsec, you don't have a corporation holding an area of space, per se. It's done on an alliance scale, and those alliances are multiple corporations working together. Basically, a corporation is just a part of an alliance. It's kind of the smaller building brick of an alliance. Um, now, in EVE Online, yes, a lot of things are tied to your alliance, not to your corporation. In EVE Echoes, this is the other way around. So let's see what Melos says. Thanks for your advice. At the beginning of development, we had discussed the range of the corporation add-on structures. Basically, would they affect just corporations? Would they affect nearby systems? How would that all work? Um, indeed, for large alliances, it can bring greater benefits if the add-on structure works alliance-wide. But this also makes it more difficult for smaller alliances and corporations to compete with larger alliances. Therefore, to maintain the balance in Nullsec, we believe it is fair to limit the effective range of corporation add-on structures within corporations. And I kind of get that. It also means that your alliance has a bit more of sort of an almost multicultural identity. Each corporation that makes up that alliance can still be a part of a greater whole whilst having its own unique identity. So like, for example, Catskull does things differently in Void compared to some of the other alliances, uh, some of the other corporations out there. So us having our own Citadel that has its own bounty structures and things like that does kind of make sense because we rat together, we will quite happily, you know, defend and fight for PvP with our allies, but for the most part we can do things our way in our sector of space. That said, for structures like that, I kind of get that it would be cool to spread those across the entire alliance. So, for example, if the Catskull Citadel had a bounty management center that affected anyone who is in our alliance rather than just our corp, it means you can bring friends to come along and rat and they still get the same bonuses they would in their home system, which, you know, that's cool. However, I do also see where Melos is coming from, and it also has the additional benefit, I think, as well, of enticing players to build more corporation citadels. Before they started adding all these corporation add-on structures, essentially most alliances operated out of one or two citadels in their home territory, and just every corporation in that alliance would operate out of that citadel, because there was no real need to have multiples, and of course there's strength in numbers. This meant that, essentially, rather than conquering an entire region, you kind of just had one constellation, which is where your alliance did its thing. So, by making this corporation-based rather than alliance-based, it means each corporation now needs its own corporation citadel, which, of course, is good news for anyone building corporation citadels. Um, but it also means that the sovereignty map has drastically expanded. 
And beyond that, now that we've got the sinusural field generator structures, we're looking, for example, in Cat Skull, not just to have our home base with one of these, but to have a whole chain of these beacons that we can light to get capitals to and from where they're needed without necessarily needing to um, use uh, covert ops ships and sinusural field generators installed on ships. Obviously, that is the easier way to do things. It's the cheaper way by far. Um, but you, it's enticing us to build more citadels and thus expand our sovereignty. And the further we expand our sovereignty, the thinner our defences are going to be, which means that suddenly that you've got this whole pull and you know pull and tug, uh, pull and push here to sort of like a war um, situation where if there is going to be fights going on, suddenly the outlying, the frontier stations are you know are in need of a bit more defence. And it, I I I like that. I really think that adds a lot of strategic depth to the game by not making it alliance-wide. So I kind of agree with Melos here that going uh, corporation-wide rather than alliance-wide actually does add more strategic depth to the game than going alliance-wide. Alliance-wide is easier, corporation-wide is a bit more intricate and a bit more strategic. Will you all add abyssal space? Adding this, I feel like it would make it more friendlier to newcomers to make some isk. Now, this is where I'm going to scroll back, because this bit that I've used here for the intro of this video and for the thumbnail is a screenshot of EVE Online Abyssal Dead Space. Now, Abyssal Dead Space, for those who don't know, uh, was something added, I think, during the when the Triglavians were added. Triglavians are a whole new uh, faction in EVE Online. Um, they have some really cool ships, actually, like the Kikimora and the Damovic. Both very cool frigates and destroyers. Um, and they've got their own unique weapons and stuff as well. But an Abyssal Dead Space. Essentially, you find these filament items. And you find them through scanning relic and data sites. Um, those relic and data sites will drop these filaments. You use the filaments to create a gate, which is what you saw in that image a moment ago. Now, obviously, the, you, the, the filaments come in, I think, four or five different types. I think it's a zero through four. So zero, one, two, three, and four. The higher the number, the more difficult the content. Kind of like our tech levels, I guess. Um... You use these filaments to create a gate. That gate can be scanned down by other players. So when you jump through it and try the Abyssal Dead Space inside, other players could scan that down and wait for you to come out at the end of it. It's a nice little PvP sort of segment in EVE Online. But what is an Abyssal Dead Space itself? It's kind of like Nihilus Dead Space in its, its own unique pocket of space, and it does look really cool. I mean, it's all misty and foggy with this sort of purple aesthetic going on to it. Very dark and mysterious. Um, it's got multiple rooms, usually three rooms that have to be completed in order um, with rats in them. So kind of think like a scout or inquisitor anomaly rolled with a dead space. It's not uh, with a nihilus. It's not that kind of, uh, you know, you can go into multiple different rooms. It is just a progression of rooms. When you when you first create the gate, a 20 minute timer starts. You then have three rooms to clear before you can warp out. You cannot warp out of an abyssal dead space once you are inside it the only way out is by completing it or when it collapses so you've got 20 minutes to, com uh, to complete three rooms worth of content and get out and each room is an arena that kind of has like a red ring of death around the outside that you cannot fly through you'll lose your ship if you do and if the dead space collapses when you are in it it destroys not only your ship but your pod and in EVE Online that is a big thing because not only do you have your ships and all its fittings but your actual character can have some very expensive implants kind of think of rigs but for your character so they apply across every ship that you fly um but you lose those when you're podded so if you jump into an abyssal dead space and you fail to clear all three um waves all three rooms before the 20 minute timer is up you lose your ship and your pod and you are sent back to whatever station is your home base with nothing they are cruel they are harsh but they have some amazing Amazing rewards in them and adding them to EVE Online I think would uh, EVE Echoes would be really cool because it's extra PvE content it's kind of a gauntlet challenge to run with your mates and um, something for like three to five players which is really cool and the kind of content we are sort of lacking at the moment um it in inspires some PvP because if you spot one of these you might decide that you and your friends are going to camp it and wait for the person to come back out probably because they're going to be bruised and battered but this is not beginner's content Oh, and it also adds to exploration, which, as you guys know, is something I'm always willing for them to add more to. This is not beginner's content, though. If you want a Tech 5 player to jump into one of these things and then lose their ship because they're not clearing it fast enough, that's not beginner content. 
Anyway, Lance Dot says, thanks for your advice. Abyssal Dead Space gameplay is featured in EVE Online, may be too complex for beginners, and conflict with other anomalies and encounters. However, we do plan to enrich an, uh, the beginner PvE experience, and are exploring various options to expand beginner gameplay. I think adding beginner gameplay is always going to be a good thing. Um, Abyssal Dead Space is not a thing to add for beginners, for sure. This is a complex system, having to find these filaments, having to make a gate, and knowing that you've got to clear all three of these rooms before the time runs out or you lose your ships, it's, it's tough. It's, it's content I would love to see in EVE Echoes. It adds to scanning, it adds so much stuff to the game, but not for beginners. Like seriously, add this later on, add an EVE Echoes version of this, absolutely, for like Tech 7 or above. Heck, even Tech 5 and above, have like, you know, your, your zeros, one, two, three, and four, and zeros are based on Tech Level 5, something like that. Abyssal Space is awesome, it's great fun, but not for beginners. Anyway, moving on. Are there plans on adding upgrades to current combat-focused Tier 7, Tier 8 battle cruisers, such as Navy issue variants? Because there is no upgrade path, higher tech tier players can only resort to command ships even if they don't use command bonuses. And this is kind of true, so for example using the Minmatar tree. At tech level 7 you get the Hurricane Prototype or the Cyclone. If you go for the Cyclone, you're pretty okay for doing PvE and PvP content after that, because you go from the Cyclone to the Cyclone Guardian to the Cyclone Guardian 2, and the Cyclone Guardian 2, I need to do a video on that ship. It is amazing. It's an incredible ship. It is basically a battleship as far, uh, but with battlecruiser sort of speed and size and price tag notably. Um, it's an amazing ship, but if you went for the Hurricane, you have the prototype Hurricane at Tech 7, you have the main Hurricane at Tech 8, and that's where the combat capabilities stop. Because at Tech 9, your Hurricane is a logistics Hurricane, which is not going to clear any like solo PvE content, um, and you can use it as a bait cane for sure in PvP, and you can use it as a logi cane, but it's not a combat uh, ship is the point I'm getting at here. And then at tech level 10, your Hurricane is the Hurricane Guardian, which equally is not a DPS ship on account of it having no high slots hardly. It's... I get where this is coming from here. Yes, I would love to have a Tech 10 combat hurricane, so a Hurricane Navy issue, or a Hurricane 2, like we had the Stabber. At Tech 6, you had the Stabber Fleet issue, Tech 7 got the Stabber Sniper, or Tech 8, whichever it was, and then you got the Stabber 2 at Tech 10. We need the same for the Hurricane. We need the same for the Myrmid... not Myrmidon, sorry, the Brutix, the same for the Harbinger, and the same for the... I want to say Ferox, but it's not. They swapped these in Eve Echoes. It's the Drake. The Ferox for some reason is the one that does have the command variants, um, whereas the Drake is the one that goes to Logistics and to, uh, to to Guardian, Drake Guardian and Drake Logistics, so we need a Tech 10 Drake combat, basically. Either a Drake Navy issue or a Drake 2, whichever way you want to name it. Thanks for your advice, says Wilson. When developing ships for each tech level, we cannot put ships of all types in every tech level. This will result in an excessive number of ships, which it would. Imagine if you had a tech level 7, Hurricane, Hurricane Logistics, and Hurricane Prototype, then you had all of those again at tech level 8, 9, and 10. That's 12 different Hurricanes alone. That's insane. Our current plan for tech 2 to 9 is that the added ships must be of a new tonnage or a new type. Only for Tech 10, each tonnage would have advanced versions of all types of ships, such as the Cruiser Covert Ops 3 and the Battleship Striker. Now what this means is that, actually here she kind of misses the question early on, but then sort of roundabout answers it accidentally later, where she's saying that there would be an advanced version of all types of ships. So yes, there should be a Hurricane at Tech 10 that is a combat ship, just like there should be a Thrasher, Coercer, Cormorant and Catalyst. Ahem. <clears throat> and a Rifter. Trista. You, you, I'm not going to go down this one. You get what I'm saying here. Unfortunately, they've kind of broken their own rule there, even in the example Cruiser Covert Ops 3. The fact that it's a Covert Ops 3 at Tech 10 means that there is a, t a version 2 below Tech 10, which is not a new tonnage or a new type. If you've got a Bellicose at uh, Tech 6 and then a Bellicose Covert Ops at Tech 7, that is a new type. It's a, it's a covert ops rather than just the bellicose. Just like the bellicose interdictor is a new type. It's not a new tonnage, but it is a new type. Then if you have a bellicose covert ops 2, that's not a new type anymore, nor is it a new tonnage. So the fact that those exist breaks the rules, and it's the same with the Tornado 2, and there are so many of these. Every time I've said, you know, I disagree with the fact that there's a 3, basically so do Netties, but they did it anyway for some reason. I don't know. 
I don't know, but there's good news there at least. Each tonnage would have advanced versions of all types of ships. So yeah, eventually we can look forward to having a Hurricane 2 or a Hurricane Fleet issue. Hurricane Fleet issue not only exists in EVE Online as an actual thing, it actually sort of exists in EVE Echoes. Because if you open up the Hurricane and go into its skins, you will see that there is of course the Minmatar Navy issue skin, which you can put straight over the Hurricane to make it look like a Hurricane Navy issue, which is one, badass, and two, a ship that we direly need in the game. Please Please definitely add a Tech 10 Hurricane. The fact that ultimately Silent Rose is resorting to, uh, I changed to battleships and now actually Silent Rose is skilled fully into carriers, believe it or not, um, it pains me. I want to be flying a Hurricane at Tech level 10, but there is no good option other than the Guardian or the logistics which require other people to be doing the damage and I'm purely fleet support. I want a hurricane that I myself can be flying. Give me a hurricane too, give me a hurricane fleet issue, don't care which way you call it, just give it to me. Finally then, those who are at Tech 6 have to wait for an absurdly high amount of days to level up. Even free skill points are not enough to level up, and this amount of time to level up goes exponentially high the higher your tech level is. Yes, it doubles every time. It takes you twice as long to go from tech level 5 to tech level 6 as it does from tech level 4 to tech level 5, and so on. It restricts many of the fun features at Tech 7. Um, what features, I'm asking this genuinely, what features are restricted to Tech 7? I know obviously strip mining and things are, but those are also locked behind Omega. Scanning's Tech 5, um, War Games is Tech 5, I guess Battle Cruisers are Tech 7? Is that the only, th that's the only thing I can think of that is actually locked to Tech 7? Um, so I don't know, anyway. So please include a regular leveling up feature that works on other factors so you don't have to wait almost a year to level up to 10. I'm going to say right now, I really hope that they never add a grindy level up mechanic like World of Warcraft or Final Fantasy XIV or other MMOs where you get experience for doing quests, you get experience for killing enemies and things like that. That's not what EVE's about. EVE has always been about the passive skill game. It's you set a queue of skills and you just let it level up over time. And it... it I get that with the tech level, it's kind of gating some of that content. EVE Online technically does have gating. Like, you can't jump into something like an Interceptor on day one, because something like a Claw or a Stiletto actually does require specific skills in order to fly. Same with, like, the Assault Frigates. And if you want to train, for example, the Assault Frigate skill, you need to have trained up Minmatar Frigate to a certain level first of all. And it's, you know, so this system does sort of exist in EVE Online. I just really don't like the thought of them adding stuff where if you complete missions um, or kill ships and things like that, you get bonus skill points. I mean, outside of the beginner, uh, the, the, the tutorial, that's really cool and it's a nice incentive to actually get you to go through that. But for standard repeatable content, no. I'm kind of against that because it entices grinding. People already have FOMO around skill points. If you add the ability to accumulate skill points through grinding, suddenly you've, you're enticing everyone just to log on and just grind whatever is the best way to get uh, skill points and just do nothing else. It makes the game boring as all hell. It means that, like, for example, recently, you know, I've been doing a lot of flying around and just exploring, looking at the site, saying hi to randomers in local. I wouldn't be doing that because I'm like, oh, I'm going to be missing out on skill points. The fact that skill points are a passive accrual I'm all for, it's one of the th staples of EVE, it's what makes EVE, EVE, that you don't have to push yourself to level up, it happens over time. Now as Cloud here says, there are currently the following ways to increase the speed of acquiring skill points, monthly login rewards, event rewards, and growth fund. These already are pushing you to level up a lot faster than the first time we all went through, and I can say this honestly, it was about 10 months for Captain Benzi to go from brand new character to tech level 10, whereas the alt I've recently rolled for industry in that is already so much higher than it was at the same time for my other characters. It's leveling up faster because I'm getting daily login rewards, there are event rewards from the Concord Pass, the growth fund, every time I hit a new tech level I'm getting bonus skill points there. There's also, they haven't mentioned it here, obviously Omega and Combo Omega um, and Cognitive Neuroscience chips. Those are all ways to help you level up faster. 
Ultimately, I am still of the opinion that there is plenty of content at below tech level 7. We've got folks in Catskull who are lower than tech 7, who still come on PvP roams with us, who still join us in PvE, who still do exploring, still do all kinds of stuff. It's just making sure you find people that you can do this stuff with, rather than asshats who tell you, oh, you're too t low tech level, and exclude you from playing the game. That's not a problem with the game, that's a problem with the people that you're hanging out with. Find better friends, seriously. There is so much content you can do at low tech levels that people will help with. And quite frankly, if we have a guy come along in, like a tech 6 player, come along in his stab a fleet issue and he loses that in combat or whatever, there are so many of us at tech level 10 who can sit there and go, you know what, a stab a fleet issue is nothing to us. Here's a full replacement. Here's some upgrades to some of the gear that you had. Here, you know, people will help each other out. I get that it feels like it's a long climb. I do. And it can sometimes feel like things are gated and, oh, I really want that ship, but I've got to wait all the way to Tech Level 7 to fly it. Believe me, I did that with Silent Rose. I wanted to be flying nothing but Hurricanes, and I had to sit in Stabbers for a while. I love the Stabber. It's a great ship, but it's not what I wanted to fly. And so having to wait that long to fly a Stabber, yeah, I, I get it. It can be frustrating, but there's still stuff to do, and I'm glad that I learned through a Stabber first of all, because it taught me a lot of skills that I'm using now when flying that hurricane and that's the key point it's not just about accruing actual skill points it's about developing your skills and connections and knowledge as a player being able to just jump into a battle cruiser or a battleship even so early on without properly understanding the skills and how to pilot it is just a bad experience and as, as cloud says there are ways to speed that up just some of them do require payment. Not all of them do. The event rewards, growth fund, login rewards, those are skill points you get without needing to pay for anything. You can pay to get even more, like with the Concord Pass and with the daily login rewards if you go Omega, but this is a subscription-based game. You should have Omega anyway, so you should be getting all of those uh, daily login rewards at least, and you'll be getting the growth fund for free as well. I don't know. That's just my thoughts and opinions on that one. I know that could be controversial. We're all allowed our own opinions. Maybe you think actually we should be leveling up faster. Maybe you think it's already too fast and they should actually slow it down. It's definitely faster now than it was when like the players currently at tech level 10 were first going through it. Um, so I don't want to be like that guy who got there and well, and back in my day, we had to walk uphill both directions. Um, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that it's better than we had it, and I'm not sure I'd want it to go much faster because that causes problems. But hey, that's my personal thoughts and opinions. Otherwise, yes, give us tech, uh, 10 versions of all of the different ships. Please, a Hurricane Tier 10. There was a Hurricane E-War at one point, and it looked amazing, but they took it away and gave us a Hurricane Guardian instead. <sighs> Um, then we had Abyssal Space. Yes, Abyssal Space I would love to see added or something equivalent to it, um, something that involves scanning um, and this sort of gauntlet function to it, just not as beginner content. And as for jump bridges, oh, one thing I forgot to mention there, jump bridges. This is something I'd actually like to see added to EVE uh, Echoes as well. Jump bridges are basically stargates that you can build for your own alliance, and you can connect them to other systems. Um, in fact, you can connect them to other alliances. And if you have like different permissions, um, you maybe it'll alert you. It alerts you basically that, oh, this could be a one-way jump, and it just uses fuel. The alliance in control of it just has to keep it stocked up. That's something pretty cool, and I'd love to see them add. Um, that does work alliance-wide. In fact, you can open them to public use as well if you really, really want to. Um, I don't think many alliances do that because of the insane amount of fuel that that would just take with someone trolling you and just jumping backward and forward, backward and forward with the biggest, highest tonnage kind of ships possible. But yeah, I think jump bridges could be interesting, but otherwise we've covered that video. I, I'm excited about that. And if you like the answers to these questions, if you want to know more about what's possibly coming in the game, please do make sure that A, you head into the description of this video, click the link and go through to the Google document where you can ask your own questions. If your question is chosen, not only do you get the answer, not only do you get uh, featured in one of my videos, you'll also win a month of Basic Omega. It's a great way to be in contact with the devs and stay tuned to this channel. Click subscribe and ding that notification bell for all notifications if you haven't already because there is the developer AMA from the Eve Echoes Discord coming over the next couple of days and that's got some really interesting responses and answers and questions in it as well. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Please let me know your thoughts and comments in the comment section down below. Otherwise, happy sailing and see you in Eve Echoes. And you, Eden. I said the wrong thing that time, didn't I? Happy sailing and see you in New Eden. Wow.